Welcome back to International Relations 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topics are oil wars and wars inefficiency puzzle. And more specifically, the question I want to ask today is whether war can be mutually beneficial. And to get some leverage over that question, I want you to think through the following crisis. Imagine that Saudi Arabia discovers an oil deposit worth $80 billion. Kuwait hears about this and declares that the oil deposit is actually on its side of the border and belongs to Kuwait, not to Saudi Arabia. The sides call in their respective militaries and start preparing for war. At the first war meeting, Saudi Arabia's military commanders instruct that Saudi Arabia will win the war and the $80 billion of oil 60% of the time. But they also warn the heads of state of Saudi Arabia that the cost of death and destruction and lost oil will be $12 billion. Meanwhile, Kuwait's military is making the same sort of calculations. And Kuwait's military informs Kuwait's heads of state that Kuwait will win the war and the $80 billion in oil 40% of the time. You'll notice that this matches the expectation of Saudi Arabia's commanders. Saudi Arabia thinks that it's going to win the war 60% of the time. Kuwait thinks that it's going to win the war 40% of the time. That adds up to all 100%. But also like Saudi Arabia's military commanders, Kuwait's military commanders warn that there's going to be death, destruction, and lost oil, this time amounting to $15 billion. I now have an interactive question for you. Is war inevitable between these two countries? You might want to pause this lecture and think about that for a moment. If you have an answer to that question, go ahead and fill it into the discussion down below. And once you're ready, let's resume through this and think through whether war should be happening between these two states. Well, let's first calculate Saudi Arabia's needs. If Saudi Arabia goes to war, their expected payoff is $80 billion in oil revenue times 60% minus the $12 billion in cost. All told, the expected profit from war is $36 billion. So in order to be willing to forego war, Saudi Arabia must receive at least $36 billion. Meanwhile, if we look through Kuwait's needs, we have a similar sort of calculation. $80 billion will be won 40% of the time, but Kuwait will pay $15 billion in costs. Thus, for Kuwait to be satisfied and want to not fight a war, it needs to receive at least $17 billion. Based on all of this, you may think that we have a sensible explanation for war. Kuwait sees a net profit in expectation from fighting. $17 billion is better than nothing. Likewise, Saudi Arabia gets $36 billion in expectation, and that is also better than nothing. Both of these countries would prefer fighting a war to conceding the issue. It thus, at least in some sense, is reasonable to believe that these countries may be fighting as a result. Let's think about bargaining. And if we consider how bargaining might work between these two countries, suddenly war no longer makes sense. Saudi Arabia's and Kuwait's demands in total sum to only $53 billion. But you will remember that there was $80 billion in oil revenue to go around originally. You should wonder then, where did that other $27 billion go? Well, the answer is the costs of war ate it up. The costs for war were $15 billion and $12 billion, and it is not a coincidence that the sum of those two numbers is exactly $27 billion. If we think through this further, we can come up with a better resolution. Let X be Saudi Arabia's share of the settlement. Then X satisfies Saudi Arabia if it's at least 36. Meanwhile, X satisfies Kuwait if the remaining amount of money, which is 80 minus X, 
is at least 17. Or in other words, x needs to be less than 63. Thus, x is mutually satisfactory if it is simultaneously larger than 36 and smaller than 63. And clearly there are numbers that are between 36 and 63, so we are good to go. The conclusion here, any settlement that gives 36 billion but no more than 63 billion to Saudi Arabia is mutually preferable to war. Such settlements exist, and thus bargaining is mutually preferable to war, period. Now you might think that this is some sort of abstract scenario I came up with, but in fact it's not. This is not abstract. This type of thing happens. If you know a little bit about colonial history, it will not surprise you to find out that the border between Kuwait and Saudi Arabia was drawn rather poorly. In fact, the British official who was in charge of this, Percy Cox, came up with this large neutral zone between the two and didn't give too much of a thought process along the lines of how to do it exactly. And for the most part, it didn't really matter. However, in 1938, there was oil discovered around that neutral zone. But rather than get involved in a war that would be costly and destroy some of that oil and prevent the two countries from actually being able to extract it, they chopped up the territory amicably and created a multinational corporation to sell off that oil. Exactly the type of thing that our scenario here would have predicted. This type of thing is also commonplace. Here we have Colombia and Venezuela. And if you look at the northern part of South America, there's a little bit of water that juts inward. That's the Gulf of Venezuela. And both Colombia and Venezuela have territory, land territory, on the Gulf. A while back, some oil was discovered there, and this prompted Colombia to declare that they have control over half of the Gulf by virtue of the fact that part of their land is on it. This resulted in a bit of a dispute, but what it didn't cause is war. We're not always that lucky, though. Here we have Iraq and Kuwait. There's an oil field that is just north of the Kuwaiti border, inside of Iraq. And in 1990, Iraq accused Kuwait of slant drilling across that border to access the Iraqi oil field. Diplomacy did not win out this time, and there was a war. It was, in fact, quite brutal, with the United States leading an international coalition to eventually remove Iraq from Kuwait, but not before Iraq set fire to a lot of oil fields in the area. And this all leads to the central puzzle. Why do states sometimes choose to resolve their differences with inefficient fighting when bargaining, in theory, leaves both better off? That is a quote from an article called Rationalist Explanations for War, which really set off this line of research in international relations, trying to understand why states fight despite the fact that war is costly, and at least in principle, those costs should allow the states to reach a settlement that leaves both of them better off. Well, one potential answer to that question is that we just found a quirk in the payoffs that we used. Maybe there is something special about $80 billion in oil, or a 60%, 40% likelihood of winning a war, or a $15 billion and $12 billion cost of war. But what we're going to find out in this unit is that it's not a quirk in the payoffs. These results are general. You can have any probability of victory, any value of winning, any cost of war, and we'll still end up having that same result that there is a peaceful settlement that both sides prefer to fighting. And we're going to see this result in three different ways, using algebraic methods, using geometric methods, and finally with a game theoretic model. In the next lecture, we're going to tackle that algebraic model. This is going to generalize that probability, generalize that cost, and generalize that value and will essentially be replicating the same sort of proof to demonstrate that both sides should be settling and they should not be fighting a war. In the lecture after that, we are going to explore a geometric version of that proof. And this is really insightful. If you don't really understand what's going on in this lecture and the algebraic model isn't helping you, 
the geometric model will truly illuminate this result. And after you see it, you'll take a step back and think to yourself, geez, in retrospect, it's obvious that there are these settlements that both sides prefer to war. Why is it that I hadn't thought about that before? And why is it then that states are fighting wars at all? And we'll do it once more with a game theoretic model, where we'll put a little bit more structure on the interaction and see what happens when one side is actually making a specific proposal to the other side. And then once we've hammered home this idea of wars and efficiency puzzle and the presence of these settlements that both sides prefer to war, we'll then begin exploring mechanisms for why states fight wars despite the existence of those settlements. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.